Alright, Dad? Well, went to the University of Buffalo, which is all the way upstate New York, cold country. Graduated from there, and I came back. I interviewed several places, but the first job I got at law school was working for the Department of Treasury, which is Internal Revenue Service, by the way. And it was a great experience. I learned so much about taxation, but not only that, how the IRS worked and how it thought, and uh, how it affected people in all income brackets, whether or not they were very wealthy or, in fact, they were below the poverty line how deductions work, so on and so forth. But I enjoyed that because I knew at some point I was headed to private practice because I always wanted to work in my community, and I'll get to that in a moment. But when I, I left there, I then, you know, didn't jump right out into private practice. I worked for HPD, which is Housing Preservation and Development in New York City. And I got a really good education about real estate and housing in New York. And in fact, how important housing was how you, it could be an economic advantage to you if you knew how to work with real estate. But I also looked at how the homeless were being affected because there was a big homeless crisis in New York City, I'd say in the early to mid 80s. And what the city was doing about it, what the administration was doing about it. And I felt good about doing something where I was helping people, really helping people mm -hmm. uh, with HPD. And I worked for the deputy commissioner there and then I got tapped by New York City Criminal Justice Agency, most people know as CJA. That's the agency that assists people getting released on their own recognizance or at least having a low bail set. When they're arrested of a crime, right? When they're arrested of a crime, not convicted. We right. only dealt with arrest to arraignment. Mm -hmm. So the job there was to work with police department, DA's office, of course, legal aid, defense counsels, to do what we could to provide the court with enough information so someone could get released. And a lot of the young people get arrested and really don't need to spend a night in jail and certainly don't need to have to, to come up with bail money. And this is before bail reform kicked in. So it was something I was, was proud to do. We even worked with the legislature in, in fine-tuning what should be done to establish someone has, I'm sure you all know, community ties. Right. Right. What is community ties? What does it really right. mean? Okay? Right. Right. Yeah. You know that you have a place to return to at home someone who will stand up in court for you, you live with an uncle, a father, a son, whatever. But the whole point was I was always the type of person who always wanted to have my hands around working within my own community. And see, that came naturally to me because my father uh, is a local business. He's a barber. He's had the, in fact, he has the oldest barber shop in Queens now since 54 years. Oh. And that, that Can grabbed. I get a free haircut? Yeah. No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> so, uh, oh, free? <laughs> <laughs> you said yes. You got to put no, money no, back in the community. The first thing is true. You got to put back in the community. You can't take out. Or, you know, you kick something to me. And oh, okay, okay, okay. I got okay. You can work it out. Well, okay. even if you don't pay, we'll get out to you some kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> community service, something. But, okay. you know, what, what I saw was very powerful. Uh, my father, who is a black man, started a barbershop with. There were no barbershops in Southeast Queens at that time. There really wasn't. People had to go to Brooklyn. When, when was this? Long Island. This, he opened the barbershop in 1966. And I remember mm -hmm. I was 10 years old because I was, I was there the night he was, he, was, uh, he was trying to get it open. And a very funny story was that uh, the night he was, he was actually going to open it the day after the 4th of July in 1966. And the health inspector was coming. That's why I remember this so well. But again, this is all goes back to being community-based and how he had promised all these people he's going to open up, and all the people were saying, yeah, we want this to happen. And someone was supposed to show up, literally on the 4th of July, uh, for the health inspector to, to inspect on the, on the 5th of July. Uh, someone was supposed to show up to put in a vent in the ceiling of the bathroom. You have to have a vent. And if you don't, then you don't get your license, you can't open. So we actually waited on the 4th of July for somebody who never showed up. And I remember my dad climbing up on the roof and actually soaring a hole wow. in the roof <laughs> while I sat there. And I was a 10-year-old kid standing. I stood up on the toilet. I closed and stood up on the toilet, waiting for a screwdriver to come through where he was hitting it with a, <laughs> with a hammer. And, and he finally got it through, put the vent in, and Hopkins uh, Barbershop was born. Wow. So, but I saw when he opened up on the 5th, the place was loaded. And people thanked him and said, we don't have to go anyplace place else. And then he began to hire guys and train guys in barbering. And the first place he went was people who were being uh, released from jail. Mm -hmm. And he helped them get their license, okay? 
They, they had been incarcerated, he got out, he helped them get their apprentice license, he would stand up for them, and he taught them the skill. And what I love is the community accepted it. They said, all right, he's new, but let's work with him. You're trying to work with him. Because why? Because you're helping to build a community and you're helping keep this man out of jail. He's now got a job. He can feed his family. Yep. So over, over that 50-year period, he has always worked with young men and even older men to help them um, get the trade. And you know what? He was even big enough to reach out and help them open their own barbershop. Now, that comes back to me. Because you got to realize, I grew up watching this. Right. I saw the power of working in your own community and having your own and how you impacted others. So I said, you know what? I have to think about what I wanted to be. I considered medicine at one point. I considered law. Then I ran into a gentleman named Judge Leroy Keller, who actually attended the same church. And he loved the law. He just loved the law, and he talked about how we should all at least think about law school because the only way we're going to get ahead is understanding the law and knowing someone's taking advantage of us and how to fight and how to fight for them and how to fight for others. So he invited me down to his court, right there on Queens Boulevard, criminal court. And he said, I want you to show up on Monday. Now, here I am, I'm a college kid, okay? I want you to come to my courtroom and I want, want you to see what goes on. So I showed up the next day and I realized I'm a young black man walking in I have an army jacket. And what year is this? This is about 1978, okay? So I got the big afro. Bell bottoms? I got flares on. Wait, 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 what kind of afro? The Michael Jackson and that? Jackson 5 afro? Well, I didn't oh, have that, that much hair. You got all your hair. But, it, but it, was, it was the type of hair that when you walked into the courtroom, somebody said, where is he going? It was, that, it was definitely that kind of hair. Yeah. And you know, with, 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 with the, the peace sign on, but the, the fist patch okay. on this right on. And oh, I walked in, you? and of course the court officer was like, sit down. Mm -hmm. All right, I said, oh, okay, you know, I have a sit down. And then Judge Kellum pointed over the bench and said, bring him up here. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the reaction of the court officers, none of who were African American or Latino, like, okay, of course. We what a shocker. Right, we got business now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. come on up here. So I'm walking up. He said, stand there. All right, put your hands down. Like, and Judge Kellum leaned over and said, I didn't say there. Bring him up here. Mm -hmm. Right here. Like next to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Basically. On the bench. On the bench. Mm -hmm. I want him up here. And they're looking shocked. at me and looking at the judge like, what, what's going on, judge? <laughs> they're looking at each other. And by the way, get him a chair. Mm. Get him a chair. So from that point on, uh, the tone changed, should we say. Yeah. The officers got a chair and brought it up, and Judge Kellum sat me there for an entire day when he did his business. And it was phenomenal, which helped shape me. And I remember a couple of things in particular. There was a young man who was arrested <coughs> for doing something in the subway. I think he may have been smoking, he may have had marijuana, and I remember Judge Kellen leaning over to me and says, I want you to pay attention to this. I want you to look at this. He said, the evidence really isn't clear here, but I'm gonna show you how to work this. So the young man came up and he began to explain himself uh, with his attorney and he told him to be quiet. But the young man was animated and continued to try to explain. And Judge Kellen then addressed him and says, young man, Whatever you were doing in the subway, don't do it again. And as he tried to talk again, he says, young man, you're not getting it. Whatever you were doing in the subway, don't do it again. I think it took about three times for him to realize that Judge Kellen was trying to say, you're about to go home. Right. Mm -hmm. Just shut your mouth. Right. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And he leaned over to me and said, a lot of young people don't get it. And this is my time to show them how to get it. And then when the young man got it, he said, thank you, Judge. He said, just talk to your lawyer. He said, you know, sometimes police aren't bad guys, they make mistakes too. So he talked to the prosecutors and he said that maybe your, your officers didn't quite understand what was going on that day. So tell them maybe they need to think about what they do. And he sent everybody home. The point is, look at the impact. Right. You had a young man looking at another black man who understood what he was going through. Right. And understood that I don't need to give you a criminal record. You don't need a violation, you don't need a misdemeanor, you certainly don't need a felony. Let me send you home. 